as a ballet teacher, I want to know how people move. And as a math major, I want to know how they think. As it turns out, movement and thinking, particularly about numbers, are intrinsically related. And that's what I focused on as an intern at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in London, where my team and I worked on developing a technology for the classroom that heavily relies upon this idea that spatial orientation and number manipulation are related, and it could possibly help students perform better in math. Over the course of this talk, I'll introduce you to the three major discoveries that lead us to this conclusion, two main ideas I want you to take away from this new information, and I'll begin by having you picture the numbers 1 through 10 in your head and stop there. Just think about where those numbers are in your mind right now. Take a mental snapshot and then put that picture in your pocket to save for later. We'll pull it back out again in just a few minutes. Before we do, I want you to wiggle your fingers around. Just think, or, wiggle your fingers around and make sure they're still working because as it turns out, using your fingers is very important for being able to do math. In fact, our first discovery is the idea that people all over the world start to count by using their fingers. There's a tribe called the Yupno, and yes, you heard that correctly, it is pronounced Yup, no. <laughs> and it's a group of indigenous people that were previously untouched by modern society until the 1970s, when a group of researchers led by David Lancey decided they needed to be disturbed so that we could probe them for their mathematical secrets. So he and his team of researchers marched into the mountains of Papua New Guinea to ask these people how they count. And the answer was, at least at first, on their fingers. They counted the same way we do, getting up to five on their right hand, six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the left, all the way up to 20 using their toes. And then they did things a little bit differently. They said 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. And then the women had to stop counting <laughs> because the next few numbers in the Yepno system are 31, 32, 33 for penis, and that is the Yepno representation of a base. So just as we have a base system of 10, and multiple 10s is 10, 20, 30, the Yupno have a base system of 33, or what they call a man, and multiple men are 33, 66, 99. In fact, they tie this relationship of body parts to numbers so tightly that they don't even have separate words for numbers. They just use the body part names. So instead of saying, for example, I have 16 sheep, a yup no man would say, I have right pinky toes many worth of sheep. And that just goes to show you that some cultures really tie their bodies to being able to use numbers. And the point here is that learning to count on your fingers is not something that American preschools teach you so that you can be embarrassed later on when you're still counting on your fingers under the desk in calculus class. <laughs> it's a method of number representation developed independently by a variety of cultures. And the main idea is that you are built with this and other intrinsic natural skills to help you count. So why is this? Why fingers? How does my body know to count this way? One idea has to do with where math is handled in your brain. So take your fingers back out again for a second and move them up to your head for me, like you have a math test in the morning and you're kind of stressed out. Now put your right hand back in your lap and your left hand should be hovering over the part of your brain called the left parietal lobe. And that is where the math module is hypothesized to be located. We know that there's a math module separate from, say, a language comprehension or a speech module, because damage to this particular part of the brain has different effects than damage to, say, the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe. 
We see this very clearly in a woman named Donna who was studied by Steven Anderson at the University of Iowa after suffering severe complications following a brain surgery. On the left-hand side, you'll see that she had no trouble whatsoever performing arithmetic clearly, concisely, accurately. She did struggle with something so simple as writing her own name in figure G, the word dog in figure F, and even writing a simple sequence of letters in figure E. This tells us that the part of Donna's brain that was damaged specifically had to deal with writing and manipulating letters and words as opposed to writing and manipulating numbers. This and other studies like it that have to do with patients that have had strokes or suffered lesions tell us that there is a part of your brain that specifically is meant to handle numbers or the math module. What's interesting about this area is that it's also associated with a variety of functions. For example, the ability to manipulate your hands and your finger positions. The ability to tell left from right is also handled in this region, along with the ability to comprehend spatial awareness. So that's a really important ability if you want to do something like teach ballet or be a math major. And the relationship between math and space is covered in one of the most interesting discoveries in all of numerical neuroscience, the SNARK effect. SNARK stands for Spatial Numerical Association of Response Codes. And that's just a fancy way of saying that numbers have their own relative positions in space. So take that picture back out of your pocket from the beginning and think about where you saw the numbers 1 through 10. Did you see them coming at you from behind, floating from top to bottom, spinning around themselves in circles? If you're like the 20 French students that were studied by Dehan et al. in 1993, you see your numbers progressing in order of magnitude from left to right. This discovery came about in the same way that many of the most fascinating scientific discoveries do, and that is completely by accident. Dehan and his team were really trying to figure out if there was a relationship between space and parity, or odd versus even numbers, and instead found a relationship between space and number magnitude. So they had participants sit in front of a computer screen that flashed Arabic numerals on it and press the right hand button if it was even, the left hand button if it was odd, or vice versa for a separate group. They didn't see a correlation there, but they did see that participants were pressing the right hand button a lot more quickly for larger numbers like 789, and the left hand button more quickly for smaller numbers like 123. This relationship held consistent even if they asked participants to cross their hands over each other and press the right hand button with the left or the left hand button with the right and saw that people were still pressing the right button more for those larger numbers. So that demonstrated that this truly had to deal with the hemisphere of space and the number of magnitude rather than handedness. So a natural question might be to ask yourself, is this relationship intrinsic or is it learned? Are we born thinking about numbers this way or do we learn it from seeing them presented to us in such a fashion over the course of our lives? And the answer is that we are not entirely certain yet, but we do see this correlation come about in some surprising circumstances, namely in Hebrew speakers who read from right to left but still demonstrate the snark effect. People who are blind since early childhood still demonstrate the snark effect. And even seven-month-old babies, although we test them differently, still demonstrate the snark effect. So what can we do with this information now that we know it exists? We know there's a relationship. How can we use it? And one idea would be to think of embodied cognition. Embodied cognition is a term I want you to remember, and it basically just means that where your body is located in space, 
affects the way that you learn and think about something that's, that you're trying to internalize. So a woman named Tanya Link, who was a postgraduate student, decided to study the relationship between embodied cognition and the snark effect we just learned about. And she wanted to do so by having participants represent number magnitude on a number line in two different ways. The first group represented their number magnitude on an iPad where the line was marked from 0 to 100. And she'd say, OK, show me where 70 is. And the participants would mark it right here. A second group was asked to physically walk across a number line where the walls in the room might represent 0 to 100. And she'd say, show me where 70 is. And the students would have to walk there and say, here's 70. So they controlled for the idea that students might learn better by just moving around and having fun by having the iPad group also walk across the length of the room every time they made a mark on their iPad. Interestingly, the group who represented number magnitude using their bodies performed better on a subsequent arithmetic test of single digit addition. What this tells me is that using the concept of embodied cognition or space and bodies in a math classroom might perhaps help students to better understand the fundamentals of numbers, like their relationship and position on a number line. So that kind of leads me into the second main idea of the day. Sorry, this was the third discovery. Um, the second main idea is that it's kind of just a new way to think about math. I want you to think of it as the spatial representation of more abstract numerical concepts. If you're unsure what that means, I'll leave you with a final example by using something called the golden ratio. And it's called the golden ratio because it's a very important golden concept in mathematics. And if you're unsure what a ratio is, or kind of how to represent it, um, that's OK, because it's abstract. It has to deal with relationships. Relationships are inherently abstract ideas. But we can represent it physically using our bodies, for example. So if you will follow me, you can actually imagine the red line as the length of your forearm. You can hold it up in front of you and see that the length ranging from your fingertips to your elbow is the solid horizontal line. And the intersection, vertically, in the kind of halfway off to the left there, is your wrist. So the length from elbow to wrist is part B. The length from wrist to fingers is part A. And the ratio of the entire length to the big part B is equal to the ratio of the big part B to the smaller part A. So now we've taken kind of an abstract idea like a ratio and represented it using our bodies. And it just serves as the perfect example, among many, many others, of the idea that you are designed to do math. Thank you.